from the first section of the chapter, you learn that there's all these different kinds of partnerships that can happen. General, limited, LLC, LLP, okay? We, we got the vocabulary down. The second part, or 12.2 of the chapter, oh golly, is what, what accounting activity is associated with partnerships. How does that differ? And you know, it, it really doesn't differ that much, but the three big types of accounting activity that you need to know about when there's a partnership is how to form the partnership and what transactions go with that, how to divide, hopefully the net income, but in some cases net loss. And then what, is, what does it all look like on the financial statements when there's two people? Well, when there's two or more people, there's going to be two sets of capital and there's going to be two sets of drawing. So that already is going to look different. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. And then I've got little uh, snapshots of my, my lecture in your notes. So first, and you should have this whole thing in your notes, first of all, Two people want to combine their proprietorships and start a partnership. They come together, hopefully in writing, more than just a handshake, but you can form a partnership with a handshake. But hopefully it's more in writing. They come to the table and say, here's what I can bring to our business. Okay, it looks like each of them are going to show up with a little cash. They both, actually no, only a Rolf has equipment but it's depreciated some, which we'll get to in a minute. But then T. Shea has some AR attached to him. So it's, it's coming together. They're like, all right, here we, here we go. Here's what I can bring. And they form this partnership with some capital in hand. Okay. We don't take into consider book value. We don't care what they paid for it. We don't care what the book value says. What we need to know and formulate is what's called the fair value. What is the fair value of these assets that they bring to the table? Okay. It looks like A. Rolf has some cash and so does T. Shea. A. Rolf has equipment that's depreciated. And T. Shea has $4,000 worth of um, AR minus a thousand that the fair value that he won't recover. But now before I get into the actual transactions, please add this somewhere on that page because I don't think it is in your notes. When a partnership is formed and they bring capital to the table, some of the values are included and some are not. And remember it's all based on the fair value amount. Not the book value, not the original cost, the fair value. When someone brings an AR balance, which you really could look at that as bad. Like that's baggage. Holy cow, $4,000 or whatever it was of AR. Now that is an asset because you own the right to getting paid and you hope to get cash out of that eventually. So that could be seen as a good thing, but I see it as like, holy cow, you have this much owed to us. You also have to include the allowance for doubtful accounts. Why? You hope to get paid, but there's a chance you won't. So not only are you bringing baggage with, but there's a, there's a lug of a allowance hanging behind that baggage as well, because if you come with AR balances, there is the chance you won't get paid. And that risk is assumed when you start this partnership. Okay, not included. Yeah, you'll list your equipment, but you don't bring with any of your accumulated depreciation. You might say, why? That devalues the asset. Well, let's, uh, I'm going to read to you exactly what the book says. And this is all talked about on page 573. It records the equipment at fair value. It does not carry forward any accumulated depreciation from the books at the previous business. 
So it it'll take your new or your equipment, but we're not going to take any of your accumulated depreciation that's built up and devalued that equipment. Okay. In contrast. The gross claims on customers are carried forward to the partnership, and the partnership adjusts the allowance for doubtful accounts to arrive at a net cash realizable value. So basically, the ball and chain of allowance comes with, but not the ball and chain of depreciation. So now let's take a look at what the entries would look like. We've got one for A. Rolf. And we've got one for T. Shea. Now you have that little chart that I had a, a couple slides back. You, you should see this. And basically this is what we're going to journalize. They both have cash. One has AR and one has equipment. To realize what their new capital account is. So here we go. A. Rolf, he brought $8,000 to the table. And he also brought $4,000 worth of equipment. And you might say, hold the show. The book value of the equipment is five. Why are we listing the fair value? That's just what you list when you form a partnership. Do we care that it has $2,000 of accumulated depreciation with it? We do not. So his capital is actually valued at $12,000 because of the two assets he brought to form his capital. So just imagine like a little partner coming to the table with this suitcase full of goodies. Here is what I can offer my new business. T. Shea brought more cash, but he has those ARs hanging with him. They're both seen as assets. I will tell you that his capital amount is also going to be 12,000. What's going to force it to be 12,000? What do we have to subtract off? Yes, Mallory's right. The allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra account to the AR. So then his actual capital will be 12,000 as well. So he brought more value in assets, but he had that contra account that, <laughs> yeah, $4,000 are owed to me, but we've got to account for the probability that these ARs aren't going to pay us. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And we're setting up our partnership, what each of them bring, because now, A. Rolf's 8,000 and T. Shea's 9,000 are really no longer theirs. They're the businesses. It's just like when you first learned about capital and the owner invests $1,000 in the business. That's what this is. It's just that we're splitting it out with partners this time. Okay, this slide. A second transaction is what happens at the end of the fiscal year when we've done all of our closing entries, we've paid ourselves, we get to divide our net income or our net loss. Do you guys remember doing these T accounts with me? Okay, the book doesn't really lay them out this way. I added the T accounts just for our sanity. Let's quickly label them. Sales has a credit balance. Expense one, expense two, expense three. They have debit balances. We dump everything into income summary as we close them. I wish I could change pen colors really easily. I'm not going to, though. So to zero out sales, we're going to put a number in the debit. But if we have a debit somewhere, what else do we need with the transaction? A credit. And here's where we closed sales. And then sales is wiped out. 
You guys remember doing this? It's the same process when we have partners. It's just we have to share the net income. Okay, then we have expense one, two, and three. Well, to zero them out, we're going to put numbers in the credits. If I have three credits, I'm going to have one debit. And that was to close the expenses. Zeroed out, zeroed out, zeroed out. Here's where you hope our sales exceed our expenses. To arrive at hopefully a net income to get these two to equal. So that's basically this step. We close all of our revenue and all, our, all of our expenses into income summary. Again, that's not new information to you. It's just now we've got to, it's not one person getting all of that money because we've got to split it out. So now we're going to close this net income, not into one partner, but we're going to divide it. Close income summary into each partner's capital based on their share. Was it a 70-30 split? Was it a 50-50 split? I think in this case it's a 50-50 split. So let's just say we made $10,000 in net income. Well, down here we have Rolf and Shay Capital with normal credit accounts, normal credit balances. And if we had a $10,000 net income at a 50-50 split, How much do they each get? 5000 And it's credited because that 10000 was debited. But, there's a but, there's also Rolf drawing and Shay drawing. They might have taken some money out. They might have taken money out of the, their drawing accounts throughout the year. Well, then there's going to be a number on the credit side here to wipe them out. And that's going to be a hit. That's going to be a negative number on their debit side. So, yeah, they get a share of the net income, but they also have to account for what, what did they take out of the business. So that process is exactly the same as when I taught it to you the first time, way, way, way back months ago. It's just that there's two partners or more. A whole part of this chapter talked about income ratios. And the thing that I even found confusing is there's many names for income ratios. They could have been income or loss ratios, profit or loss, or P&L ratios. But the book basically said, we will use the term income ratio just to simplify things. But don't be confused with all the other like little side names that it could be called. We're going to be calling it an income ratio. Okay. I'm reading right from page 575. As noted earlier, the partnership agreement should specify the basis for sharing net income or loss. Okay. Specify the basis for sharing net income or loss. There's different ways that the basis can look. It could be listed as a proportion, like a six to four split. I get six parts of the net income, you get four parts of the net, in net income. Probably a little bit easier to look at is the percentage basis, where that would be a 70-30 split. Okay, or there could be a fraction. You don't see that very often, but I get two-thirds, you get one-third. So the different types of basis, I don't even know if I'm saying the plural version of that correctly, a proportion basis, a percentage basis, or a fraction basis. It'd just be the easiest if the partners would say a 50-50 split. But there's different mathematical pieces to that. Okay, all of these five are listed on page 575. They're basically just 
how are we going to split our stuff? Are we going to pay ourselves first and then do the split? Are we going to just do the split and just call it good? There's five different ways to look at it. Um, The problems that we do are going to make it seem easier. So I'm just, I want you to know there's five different ways you can do this. It's just that we'll take it problem by problem and you're going to get, you're going to learn it that way better instead. So let's, let's take a look. This is, there's lots to this. King and Lee are co-partners of Kingsley, haha, <laughs> very creative, company. The partnership agreement, so I would assume that word means it was <clears throat> more than a handshake. Let's, hopefully, let's hope they sat down with a lawyer and drafted up some actual contractual language to make this more professional. They are going to pay themselves, okay, so their salaries are going to be 8,400 to King and 6,000 to Lee. Now you might say, whoa, why, why are you, that doesn't seem right. Well, maybe King is gonna work more. So they're gonna set some salary allowances. They're also going to set some what's called interest allowances, like they're gonna earn 10% on their capital balances. So what they came in with, they're gonna earn 10% of that. And then they are going to equally split any remainder, which is usually net income or net loss. So then they're telling you, okay, what were the capital balances? Well, King showed up with 28,000 and Lee showed up with 24,000. So they're gonna make 10% of that. But then they're also gonna get paid a salary. And then there was a net income of 22. So how do you even begin to approach all of this with, we're gonna pay ourselves, we're gonna get a little interest allowance, and then we're gonna split our 22,000 equally. So the instructions are asking you to do two things. We're first gonna prepare a schedule on how we're even gonna tackle net income, and then we're gonna actually journalize the net income. Find the next part of your notes. I want you to go to page 575 and 576 in your book. This is the division of net income. What is the net income? $22,000. You should have this little thing in your notes. Salary allowance. We have Sarah King and Ray Lee. According to that verbiage that was just presented to you, Sarah gets 8,400 bucks. Lee gets 6,000. So their salary, they're paying themselves 14,400, okay? And then they had their initial capital, like these were their, the capital that they brought to the table for the, in the beginning of the year, they get 10%, like a little kickback from that. So Sarah brought in 28,000 times 10%, and Ray Lee brought in 24,000, or his capital account was valued at 24,000 at 10%. So those two equal 52. So Sarah has already earned 11,200 for the year. Ray has earned 8,400 for the year. And the business or the partnership has basically paid out 19,6. So then what you do, this is a key number right there, you take the 22,000 of net income minus what the business or the partnership has paid the owners already to say, well, there's not much left of net income for you people because you've paid yourself and you've given yourself a little interest on your capital. So you take the 22,000 of net income minus what the partnership has paid their partners Really, there's only $2,400 left that they will split equally. 
So then 50% of net income, what I'm going to call the net net income, is only 1200 bucks for each person. So the partnership is paying them based on two things, their salary and their little kickback from their uh, capital. And whatever is left over, the net net income, that's what they're going to share. How do you journalize that? It looks like this. Income summary, which means you're basically closing <clears throat> sales. I'm going to use the word revenue again. Revenue and expenses. Once you close revenue, once you close expenses, we are left with 22000 to bring to the table. You might say, whoa, I thought they were splitting the net income and they got 1200 Well, go back to these numbers here, you guys. Don't forget that they paid themselves already. And uh, Sarah kind of was more of a invested partner. So yeah, the 1200 equal split was in there, but we paid Sarah 11 2 and we paid Ray 84 So that's where you get those two numbers, because it was their salaries and interest plus their 50, 50 split of net income. That's how we got at those numbers. What happens if our net income is lower? They're still paying themselves, but when you bring in the net income, you actually show up at a deficiency. It's like we paid ourselves too much. We pay it, that's not a good thing. It's the same people, these same 11, 2, and 8,400, we, we paid ourselves too much. Because if you take a look at what we paid, so here's our net income, but we paid ourselves too much, we actually take the difference and subtract it, almost as if it's a net loss. Yeah, we had net income, but we paid ourselves too much first. So then it's seen as a loss. Remember, we, we were given our net income. That's like the number at the top. We had paid ourselves 19,600, so 18,000 minus 19,600 is actually negative 1,600, shared equally. It's not a net loss. We still had a net income, but we got a little greedy up here. Got a little greedy. We paid ourselves too much. So our net income, even though it was income, not a loss, is seen as a, a, a hit against us. What does this look like on the financial statement? Look at what this says. Oh, I'm a little ahead of myself. I wanted to show you this first. Basically, the balance sheet looks the same. It's just that there's two. There's two partners instead of one. Instead of owner's equity and then one person underneath there, there's two. Okay, but how did we arrive at those numbers? The capital at the beginning of the year any additional investments that came in and any net income that came in minus the drawings and that what's going to show up these are the dollar amounts that are going to show up on the balance sheet taking a look at what we started with plus what we added minus what we took out. 
So the 35.4 and the 28.6 is then what actually shows up there for total owner's equity. And then this gets that much more complicated when there's three partners or four partners. More hands in the cookie jar. We have about 15 minutes to do five exercises. We'll never get through five exercises in that amount of time. We will use all of class tomorrow to finish the brief exercises. The three seniors that are going to be gone for senior mentorship, I'll visit with you quick after class to get a plan. We're going to do these tomorrow. We're going to get through probably about three of them today. But the seniors, I'm going to give, I'll visit with you quick after class to get a plan because I've got a great plan for you. I would assume the workbook has the brief exercises in them. Do you guys have them accessible? Maybe not all of them, but there's some that are laid out in a table format, and I would assume that they're there. Brief exercise 12 one. Is it in your workbooks? Good. It's 12, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in your workbook? Good. So use your workbooks because they're going to make it a little bit easier on you. We'll get through quite a few of them. And again, seniors stick around because I've got a plan for you. Okay, so brief exercise 12-1. Barbara Ripley and Fred Nichols decide to organize All-Star Partnership, Rip, or All-Star Partnership. Ripley invests 15,000, Nichols contributes 10,000, and equipment having a book value of 35. So who brought more to the table? Ripley brought 15,000 cash. Nichols contributed cash and equipment. So Nichols brought more stuff, but Ripley brought more cash, a higher value of assets, okay? They actually just want you to prepare the entry of Nichols' investment. Okay, so they don't want you to worry about Barbara Ripley and what she brought. They just say, prepare the entry to record Nichols' investment in the partnership, assuming the cash, excuse me, assuming the equipment has a fair value of $4,000. So up top, it says his equipment had a $3,500 book value, but down below it said the fair value was $4,000. Did it say anything about depreciation? We wouldn't record that anyway. So let's take a look at what just the Fred Nichols would look like. He brought $10,000 cash. He brought equipment that had a fair value of 4000 his value was 35, but the fair value was 4,000. So don't get confused with that. You're always looking for fair value. So his capital account now is valued at 14,000. Where did that dollar amount come? That was forced mass. It didn't ask us to do Barbara Ripley, but what would hers look like? Cash of 
15,000, and it would say Barbara Ripley, comma, capital of 15,000. That is all brief exercise 12 to 1 was. Let's go on to 12 2. Penner and Torres decide to merge their partnerships, excuse me, I'm going to say that always wrong, proprietorships into a partnership called the Penter Company. The balance sheet of Taurus, now we're looking just at Taurus, shows that there's some AR minus their doubtful equipment minus their accumulated. Do, which one do we care about? Which one's going to show up with the partnership? The allowance, yes. Now that he's correct on that, not the accumulated depreciation. The partners agree that the net realizable value of the receivables is actually 14.5 and that the fair value of the equipment is 11,000. How are they going to divide this out? Do you guys have something in your workbook for this? Is it kind of laid out like mine? Good. AR. AR is actually valued at this, but we take we take the sixteen thousand and we subtract its allowance. Now you might say, "Whoa, <laughs> allowance in the book says twelve. So this is what the book says. This is the book value. This would be like the fair value. And the difference then is what they're saying the new DELF allowance will be. That gets a little bit confusing because it says allowance for doubtful is 12 here. This 15 is a forced number. They made you hunt for the numbers a little bit. They gave you 16 and then they said, well, the partners decided together that their the fair value was 14.5. So then the new allowance that tags along with it is a force number of 1,500. Then there's also equipment that this partner brought to the table. It looks like the equipment was valued at 20, but then the partners decided together that the fair value was 11. And as my little notation in the answer key shows, we don't really care how much de accumulated depreciation tags along. A partnership's going to start fresh. Let's do brief exercise 12.3. Rod Dahl reports net income of $75,000. The income ratios, remember there can be lots of names that go with that, just remember income ratios, is Rod is a 60% and Dahl is a 40% split. Indicate the division of net income to each partner and prepare the entry to distribute that net income. We're using 75,000 as the net income times the 60 and 40 split to arrive at the division of net income. So $75,000 times 60% is what Rod gets. 75,000 times the 40% split is what Dahl gets. And then the entry is simply this. Income summary, remember, is when we close our revenue and our expenses. Rod gets $45,000, Dahl gets $30,000 because of the income ratio that they decided on initially when they started the business.
The next one we're going to do is a little bit more challenging. I hope you have a nice form in your workbook for it. Yeah. It's even by partner. Perfect. We're going to take it really slow because the book gives you a lot of information that you have to wade through. 12-4. PFW company reports net income of 45,000. Okay. Are they really going to split net income 45,000? No, because they're going to pay themselves first. And there might even be some interest. I forget if that's in this problem or not. So, Pitts gets 15, Filbert gets 5, and Witten gets 5. So before they even touch their net income of 45000 they're paying themselves first based on their salary allowance. So 15 plus 5 plus 5 equals a total of 25000 that they've used to pay themselves. Why the big split between Pitt, Silbert, and Witten? It's how they initially set their partnership up. So really... They only have 20000 to work with here because they started off with net income of 45, but then they have to take that total of what they've paid themselves, and this becomes the net net income. Their gross net income was 45000 Their net net income is only twenty because they've paid themselves 25000 Where did I come up with these figures? Indicate the division of net income, assuming the income ratio is a 50-30-20. 50-30-20. Kit gets 50% of that net income, so he gets 10 grand. <clears throat> Gilbert. Stay, stick around for just a second. Uh, 50, 30, 20. And that's how that shakes out. Why, when net income was 45,000, did they really only get to split 20,000 of it? What did they do first? They paid themselves. So Pitts really earned 25000 because he paid himself fifteen, and then he got the 50% of the remaining net income. We have just one little problem left to do tomorrow. If you're a senior, I want you to come up by my desk. 